Hey everyone, it's Ivan with KidBadger.com. Here to bring you part two in this Throwback Thursday series, my grandfather Ray's experience in the Navy in World War II. Picking up where we left off, over kind of tail end of the Battle of Guadalcanal, the naval battle, him aboard the USS Portland. And the planes, they, uh, they worked on that battleship all day long. They finally got it. And uh, we were out of control, of course, and uh, we couldn't go anywhere. And so there was a, I don't know, it wasn't exactly a tug, but anyway, it was a fair-sized boat or sh small ship. And uh, they tried towing us and everything and uh, juggling around. And this went on all day long, and they was trying to take us to... Uh, Tulagi Island, which is just across from Guadalcanal, because the Marines had captured Tulagi Island, so that was friendly, but they were still fighting like mad on Guadalcanal. So anyway, this went on all day long, this small tug lake or whatever it was trying to get us over, and we were dragging a whole bunch of wreckage in the water, I mean, sticking way out. And... Uh, so this goes on all day, and then it gets dark, and they're still working us towards Tulagi. And finally, about, I'd say about midnight, we get close to where we want to try to tie up there, and our PT boats are in there. They patrol all night and sleep all day. Well, they missed all the us being towed around. So when we were trying to get into Tulagi, they challenged us, and uh, back and forth on the, on the uh, radios with our captain and uh, them and the boat tugging us, and they wouldn't take, no, they insisted that we were enemy, and that's all there was to it. So they finally ended up, they fired a spread of torpedoes at us. And uh, wreckage in the water, Looked like we were making about 30 knots of dragon and all the phosphorus and what have you. So they misjudged our speed and missed us by a mile. And then uh, our officers had, our captain had fits over that, of course. But anyway, we finally uh, put a whale boat in the water with some men on it, and they went over so that the PT boats could see that we were Americans. So they got a, left us alone then, and we finally got in to Tulagi, and we tied up the bow to coconut trees and the stern to ship to coconut trees. And uh, there we were. <laughs> and uh, of course, the, the word uh, was passed along that we were in there and needed help, and so uh, they sent in the PBY plane and flew in there and landed. And they brought in a bunch of uh, divers and uh, welding equipment and burning equipment and what have you. And so they worked on us there for probably two or at least three days to get enough wreckage cut off and the, they worked a rudder around to where they thought it would tow straight. And so when they got all that, they decided uh, to uh, try to get us out of there. So when it got dark, we, uh, they took us under tow and we no sooner got a good start and they found out that uh, uh, the ship still couldn't be towed because it was still out of, so much out of whack on the rudder. So we thought we was getting out of there and turned right around, went back in tied up to the same coconut trees again, and the divers <coughs> went down and uh, worked on it again, changed the angle of the rudder, and got that straightened out. And then uh, we took off again. This time we towed pretty good, and so uh, we were towed to uh, Sydney, Australia, but the sad thing about that whole deal was the PBY when was taken off with all the divers and equipment that got us out of trouble there, crashed on the takeoff and killed the whole crew, everybody. So anyway, we were towed to Sydney, Australia, and we when we got there, 
of course, uh, the uh, Australians knew that the Japanese fleet had been come down there once and then uh, or was going to invade them and we stopped them with the carriers and what have you. So we was kind of local heroes there. <laughs> they, they had the dry dock waiting for us and everything. We went to a place called Cockatoo Island and it had a big dry dock there and they took took our crews there and there and started patching it up. And then, of course, the crew's excited because this is the first time since the war started they're going to get to go back to the States. So we were all excited we was coming back to the States, and all of a sudden we found out that the new men on the crew <laughs> were, were being taken off of the ship and sent to uh, Fremantle, Australia, which is on the west coast of Australia, because we had an advanced submarine base there. So that's uh, what happened. Uh, me and a bunch of other guys that was new ended up getting on the train with our gear. And uh, <laughs> the sad part of that was the beginning of the trip. Uh, we were in cattle cars and uh, they didn't have any room for us anywhere else. And we took our, our duffel bags and stuff and pack them in the front and get behind it because that'd break the wind off of us. And then at mealtime, they'd stop and they'd have a field kitchen on a flat car and we'd just line up and they'd feed us and we'd be back on the train and take off again until we got to the state line. Then we had to unload, get on another on the other side of the dock or, or the, at the depot and load stuff in that other train because they... Each state had its own gauge, traffic, <laughs> rail gauge. So every time we hit a state line, that's what we had to do. So we ended up in uh, uh, Perth, Australia, and then Fremantle was, I'd say, probably 14 miles or maybe more uh, north of Perth, Australia. And uh, we uh, was stationed there. I was stationed there for a few months, I don't know or don't recall exactly how many, and uh, then we got word that we was being shipped back to the States. So we were shipped back to, uh, well in the first place when we left uh, Sydney we went to Melbourne and the railroad run just to the big cities. So when we came back, we went to Sydney and then we went up to Brisbane. So I was, we went through all the major cities in Australia by train. And uh, I got put on a troop transport there. And then, uh, it wasn't a troop transport, it was just a, really a glorified cargo ship. And we stopped at, uh, I believe it was, uh, yeah, somewhere around New Guinea, and uh, took on a bunch. They took on a bunch of wounded soldiers, and uh, some of them were uh, kind of shell shocked and what have you. Anyway, they took each of our, one of us sailors, and I was assigned six soldiers that were having problems. Uh, uh, you know, from from combat fatigue and what have you. And I was in charge of them, and my job was to see that they uh, each uh, ate at the proper time. I'd take them to the mess hall and bring them back to their compartment. We stayed in that compartment most of the time. And uh, till we got back to, to the States, I had those six guys with me. And I, I never had any trouble with any of them. They were pretty mild. Uh, the, the ones that were uh, in worse shape, the doctors took care of them in the sick bay. <coughs> but I had one guy that he had his, I don't know what they call it, army sea chest or foot locker or whatever. And he'd sit on it for a little while, five minutes or so. 
Then he'd get up and he'd open it up. He'd take everything out. And he'd fool around with it and put everything back. And he'd sit down on it. Another five minutes or so, he'd get up and do the same thing. He did that all, he did that all day long, except when he was asleep or eating. Was repacking that thing. So he was the least of my worries. <laughs> he was too busy to get in any kind of trouble. But I didn't have any trouble with the guys and got him back to the States. And of course, the medics took him over. So then I was back in the States and uh, there for a while. And then I ended up catching a light uh, carrier, small carrier, CVE in uh, San Diego. <coughs> so this was uh, a new experience for me because uh, a carrier is altogether different ship in every, every shape and form than a heavy cruiser. But anyway, we got on there and uh, I'd say 95% of the crew or more hadn't had any combat experience at all. They were just out of boot camp and schools and all that stuff. But anyway, we uh, went out a few days out of San Diego and shape, shaking the carrier down because it was brand new. And breaking the crew in, we'd have uh, target practice and firing and stuff like that. But I was... When I was in Australia, my rate was changed from seaman to uh, a fireman because they they put me in a Navy garage there that was supplying cars and what have you for the uh, uh, submarine sailors there, the submarine repair ship. So anyway, I'm down there and I, I told the officer, he was a lieutenant, nice guy, he was the first trip for him, he's just out of 90 day wonder school. And I told him, I said, I, uh, I've had experience on a gun and I'm not gonna be below decks during uh, combat. And he said, well, you gotta be. And he had me a battle station there or something somewhere there, and I told him, no, I'm not. He said, well, you gotta be, and that was the end of it. Well, anyway, we went out and they, they sounded general quarters again, and uh, I just went up and sat on the stern of the ship. <laughs> anyway, they started looking for me, and I wasn't on my battle station, so when they secured from general quarters, I went back down, and, and he asked me where I was, and I said, I was up on the stern. And he said, well, you're pretty serious about this, not uh, being below decks during combat or, or general quarters. And I said, yep, I was as serious as you can get. So he says, well, you go uh, see if you can get on the gun, talk to the gunnery officer, or what have you. And I said, okay, well, the reason I wasn't below decks is because when we uh, got back in, uh, to uh, Sydney, Australia, when we went into dry dock and they started pumping the water out of the ship, they had port and starboard liberty. Fortunately, I was on the one that got to go first. The guys that was didn't get to go, they had to go down there as the water was coming out of the ship and take care of the bodies that were all trapped down there. And this guy had gone all through boot camp with. Uh, when I got back to the ship off Liberty, I could see he was, uh, something wasn't quite right with him. And I asked him what the problem was and he told me about getting these bodies and stuff. And I'm not going to go into detail, but anyway, <clears throat> that's when I made up my mind that's not for me, I'll stay on a gun. So that's what happened. And uh, I ended up being the pointer on a five inch 38. The pointer points the gun up and down, pulls the trigger, and you have telescope sights and ring sights and a few controls there that you can operate. 
And I had three ways to fire the gun. I could pull the trigger, I could stomp it with my foot on a pedal, or I could turn on a switch to fire it. So that was my job. And so anyway, we, we got out there and our first uh, assignment when we got to the Pacific was the invasion of Saipan. <clears throat> well, if you look at the map, you see Saipan's right in the chain of islands in the middle. So anyway, we went in, the Marines went ashore, and we had air attacks that could come from either way. And so we uh, had uh, some pretty severe air attacks, mostly 90% of us torpedo planes trying to get us. We did a real good job of fighting them off. We had, we operated in carrier groups of uh, six. So there were six of us small carriers and if every, every plane was working, we could put up about 120 planes, something like that. <coughs> so we uh, made a pretty good uh, show of ourselves there. And so if, if you're anybody's a history buff, you I'm sure you've heard about the Mariana's turkey shoot. Well, our planes was in on it and our big carriers was between us and the Japanese carriers. So we had a ringside seat. The trainer and I sat there the whole battle watching the, through our telescope sights. And you never saw such a sight. The sky was full of anti-aircraft bursts. It was full of red tracers full of airplanes, parachutes, you name it. It was, it was, <laughs> was all there. And uh, when that was over, we'd, uh, we, our, our planes, had shot down uh, something like 400 of the Japanese planes. And from that day on, they'd lost so many of their top-notch pilots that they never, never could really, uh, have a carrier full of experienced pilots. It was all young pilots and a few that survived as their instructors and what have you. So that pretty well took care of the situation there. But I had one exciting experience there. Uh, I was the engineer on the, on the whale boat. That's the guy that runs the motor. And uh, they passed the word that they were on the whale boat crew to report to the hangar deck. So we knew where Sponson was where you lower the boat down. So that's where the, the boatswain mate and the bow hook and myself, we got there. Well, I was running late because I had to come up from down below decks. And when I got there, the captain was talking to the, to the coxswain and he said, I want you to stay right straight between the two islands. And he says, there's a pier on the end of Saipan, and he says there's going to be an intelligence officer, Marine intelligence officer there. I want you to go in and pick him up. And he says, stay in the middle. And when you're straight off the pier, turn straight in. And he says, if you get in any kind of trouble, I'll send a destroyer to help you. So we, you know, we don't know everything that's going on in the beach, so. <laughs> We start in, and we just get a good start in there, and the Marines hadn't landed on uh, Tinian yet, so they cut down on us with field artillery. <laughs> and we got these splashes coming up around us. I jumped over the engine on the other side and jerked the throttle wide open, and <laughs> I kind of looked around to see what was going on. Couldn't see the bow hook at all, and all I could see was a coxswain hand on the tiller <laughs> trying to hold the course. But anyhow, they missed us, and, and uh, the captain, true to his word, he sent a destroyer through, and that destroyer didn't want to be there either, and he came through there about 34 knots or so, wide open. <laughs> and then when he went by us, his wake almost flipped us over. That's how bad the wake was. But anyway, 
he went on by and, and they had all the guns working on the destroyer, so they decided on the beach that was a bad idea on Tin Yan, so they quit shooting. <coughs> so we turned into the pier, and I'm up there looking to see if I see anybody. I don't see anybody on the pier. And all of a sudden I see a guy running. He's running out on the pier, and then I see wood flying up all around him. And the Japanese are shooting at him with a machine gun. And he keeps on running. And I guess the Marines uh, put some suppressing fire on him, the machine gun anyway. It quit. And he kept right on running. He got to the end of the pier, right off the end of the pier into the water. He never even slowed down. So we went over there and, and picked him up. And uh, Bow Hook and I pulled him up out of the water. And we started out uh, cocking the head in for Tinyan, straight out to the middle of the channel. And this Marine says, where the hell are you going? He says, I'm going out to the middle of the channel. He says, no, you're not. You cut across here. <laughs> he changed the course. And that kept us away from Tinyan a little bit more. So we got out there. And, and then the trouble started. They're not going to slow down the carrier when there's been submarines hunting here all the time. So they're making good speed, and we're trying to stay alongside them with the wake and uh, back and forth, and their blocks to pick up the whale boat or steel, and they're down swinging amongst the stair. And I thought, sure, somebody's going to get killed, but anyway, kept struggling around. They finally got <coughs> both the uh, hooks in to pull us up, and then whapped us three or four times real hard from being in the water and then out of the water and in the water. But anyway, they hoisted us up. And that was the end of that deal for me there. So anyway, after, after Saipan and Tin Yan invasions, uh, we went down to uh, invade uh, Ulithi. Ulithi uh, is one of the biggest atolls in the Pacific. And uh, of course they went in with uh, all our air strikes and what have you, softened them up, and uh, when the troops went ashore, there was no Japanese there. They had, invaded, <laughs> they had evacuated. <clears throat> so we had a swimming party that afternoon, went into the the minesweeper swept through and we went on into the inside and anchored, had a swimming party. That was the easiest invasion we were on right there. Then after that, I don't recall exactly uh, where we went from then, but I, one of the sidebar I might tell you is uh, one of the air attacks after you lifted there that we had, and we had several air attacks, but the uh, same old twin-engine Bettys, they'd come in on us maybe 15, 20 feet above the water, just flat on the water, and it made it hard for our, our fighter planes to dive on them to try to shoot them down because they were so close to the water. Our planes would have to pull out way early to keep from hitting the water. <coughs> so anyway, this particular air attack we was having, they were coming in probably about 3 o'clock, 3.30 after, uh, off of the ship. We went by the time uh, clock, uh, which position they were coming from. So I'd say it was probably 3 or 3.30, planes coming in on us. So we were firing between the other, two of the other carriers were off our starboard side there, and we were firing between them, and the planes were coming in through there. One of the carriers launched three fighter planes. All three of them got shot down by our own guns. And uh, anyway, the air attack going on for a while, and we were shooting. <coughs> and all of a sudden, the uh, guns started swinging. And I, I was wondering what was going on, and as I was about to raise up to see why we were the, the trainer was turning the gun so fast, and 
about that same time, the gun captain had climbed clear up over the top of the gun barrel and smacked me on top of the helmet. And of course, you couldn't hear anything because every gun was working in the fleet. And I looked up at him, and he just pointed dead astern. And I looked astern, and there was a torpedo bomber about 15 feet off of the water right on top of us. And uh, so I... You can't find anything fast in a telescope sight, so I jumped up to look through my my ring sights, and I centered in the ring sight and dropped down, and I had him in the scope, and uh, <coughs> the trainer was dead on, dead center across here. So I matched up with him and pulled the trigger, and <coughs> all this took place in about five or six seconds, I guess. and. When I pulled the trigger, it was this boom, boom. There was nothing there. <coughs> we made the torpedo go off, I guess, and it absolutely vaporized the whole plane. It just was nothing. A little splashing on the water, and that's it. Usually you'd see a plane go down and burn for a while or float for a while, <laughs> but not that one. And anyway, I don't recall which air attack that was in, but that was a good one. And after Ulithi, <coughs> uh, we were getting ready to uh, invade the Philippines. And uh, we ended up in what we call MacArthur's Navy. And uh, so we were under MacArthur's command instead of our own admiral. Our admirals were under his command, and so we were uh, escorting the uh, invasion fleet, and we believe, I believe, we left Ulithi. And when we left the carrier group, there was 18 of us small carriers, two, two rows of us, and when we got outside of there, we ended up in the middle of the convoy, the invasion convoy of, for the Philippines. We were in the middle, and you couldn't run out of ships, no matter which direction you looked, was ships. Anywhere you looked, right all the way to the horizon. So anyway, we head for the Philippines, and we're going to invade uh, Lady Go. Lady, yeah. And so we're informed of this by the captain. After a day or two out to an invasion, the captain comes on and <coughs> gives you the whole story. So we knew where we were going and what was going on. And so when we get to, to the Philippines, the Lady Island, they break the carrier group up into three groups. Six carriers to a group. There was, and our code name was Taffy One, Two, and Three. And we were Taffy Three. Taffy Three was the furthest ones north, and Taffy Two was in the middle, and of course, Taffy One was down at the beachhead. So, that sort of was the setup, and we're there the first day, and we don't see nothing. And then the next day, we're general quarters, and when I, here comes Admiral Halsey with the whole fleet. You've never seen anything like it. Huge carriers, battleships, cruisers, battle cruisers, destroyers, huge operation covered a whole area. And we were sitting there on the gun, general quarters, and man, this is the first time we've ever had that kind of help. And <laughs> so anyway, the sun goes down and there's Halsey. <coughs> we go to bed that night, sleep all night. Well, you always, we went to general quarters before the sun come up every day and every night. But anyway, we get up the next morning and we're sitting there on the gun and way out on the horizon we see these ships. Everybody in the fleet 
pretty much that's Halsey. <coughs> well, as it turned out, it wasn't Halsey. Halsey took the whole fleet that night and took off because he heard there's a couple aircraft carriers somewhere, Japanese carriers. And he took the whole fleet. He didn't leave anything there. So when the sun comes up the next morning and we see these ships out on the horizon, secure from general quarters, I'm down in the mess hall. I happen to be master at arms at the mess hall at the time, so I'm in the after mess hall. And all of a sudden, the guy comes running through there and he hollers at me, Lloyd, you better get on your gun. The whole Japanese fleet's out there. And I says, yeah, yeah. And I looked at his face and I was gone because you don't look like that <laughs> normal. And I I got on the, hit the, the deck back there where I could see around the ship a little and here's salvos coming up all around us. Those battleships, the two largest battleships that's ever been built. They had uh, uh, 18 inch guns on them. The, the projectile about the size of a Volkswagen coming at you. Anyway, there we were, you know, and uh, we had, uh, we only had two destroyers. We had five destroyer escorts, which is just about a half a destroyer. And they had the Japanese fleet on us. Well, we started laying smoke screens and uh, Two of the destroyers broke away and got word to make torpedo runs on the Japanese fleet. <coughs> so they come through us laying smoke screen, and then one of the little destroyer escorts decided he went in on it too. So the three of them went right into the Japanese fleet. Well, of course, none of them come back. They were shot all to hell. And uh, we kept running and shooting and hollering for help. Well, our other six carriers was giving ground support to the army troops going ashore at Lady. Well, when they found out what was going on, they started diverting their planes to us. <coughs> and so this goes on, the shells coming down around us for about two hours and 15 minutes until enough planes got on them that they decided they'd break it off. So. They broke it off. In the meantime, they'd sank one of our carriers and uh, our two destroyers and destroyer escort were sunk. And of course, all the carriers had been hit a little. <coughs> and so we were, of course, trying to head uh, south to get out of there, but uh, they'd keep cutting us off. But anyhow, when the uh, Japanese fleet left, and we kind of, by then we were scattered everywhere. All the ships was running different and laying smoke. And uh, so we were by ourselves, and we took off. <coughs> and over a ways was uh, one other carrier that I even recall seeing after that. And uh, we had the honor of being the first group ships to go under a suicide plane attack. So the suicide planes came down, they sank the other carrier that was over our floors. <coughs> they hit us, but they just went through the catwalk, they never got a square hit on us. So we kept going south, and we were running by ourselves, trying to get out of there. And then, uh, of course, we were at general quarters all the time, we were sitting on the gun, and it, <clears throat> it got dark, and uh, one of the other carriers <clears throat> was ahead of us, and it had been hit pretty bad, and it was leaking oil real bad. So our car captain fell in behind that ship in case they run out of fuel oil, we could take on their crew. Don't leave them sitting around out there floating around. And uh, so that went on, follow them, and we were secured from general quarters finally after we figured we was far enough away. 
And about midnight, <clears throat> the speaker come on, and when that speaker switched on, you could hear it, everybody hit the deck. They just knew it was going to be general quarters. But instead of that, they said, five-inch gun crew, man your gun. So, of course, that was me. Then I had about six guys trying to help me get my clothes on so I could get up on the gun. <laughs> and so, anyway, I, I got up on the gun, and I asked the gun captain, what's going on? He was talking to the bridge, and there's a Japanese sub coming up on us. And uh, <clears throat> so, anyway, uh, they stewed about it, the captain, our captain, whatever, they decided to hang a star shell over him. So we fired a star shell, <coughs> lit him up. Well, just as soon as we lit him up, they'd dive. And uh, so this went on for a while. But anyway, the submarine couldn't keep up with us when it was submerged, but it could catch up with us when it was on the surface because we were very fast, particularly with that one carrier shot up. So anyway, we played that cat and mouse the rest of the day. And then we got further south and we couldn't operate any planes. And of course the other carrier couldn't either. And we was really concerned about suicide planes and stuff again. And anyway, I guess the Army Air Force got word and here come a flight of P-38s. And they stayed around us, kind of kept the things calmed down a little bit. And uh, so that was pretty much the end of that. And we got, got patched up a little. We had floating dry docks. And our ships didn't have to come clear back to the States to get fixed. Could put them in a floating dry dock at these different atolls. So that's, we went in there and got patched up and repainted. And, went back out again, and uh, our next deal was with uh, going to invade uh, Luzon. This right here wraps up part two. Be sure to check back, join us for part three, and as always, thanks for joining us at kitbadger.com. Look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>